Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Today we have our second episode called Ask Me Anything, and we've got Katie Wynn. She's a songwriting student at Belmont University, and she's came to ask us questions about the business, about my songwriting process, about finding your strengths as a lyricist or a melody writer or a music writer, and we had a great conversation. I think you're going to really enjoy it, and you're going to get a lot out of it. I like these Ask Me Anything episodes because it's a little bit of a break from hearing from, you know, industry pros who have been doing it for years, but we're getting to talk with people like Kaylee Ingram and and Katie who are just getting into the business and have some of these very real basic down-to-earth questions that I think are going to be very valuable for a lot of you guys to hear. So, but before we do that, just a quick announcement on our upcoming Music Makers Boot Camp. Are you an aspiring artist, producer, or songwriter? Have you ever wanted to break into the music business but didn't know where to start? Would you be interested in spending a weekend with some of the leaders in the industry? Well, here is your opportunity. It's called the Music Makers Boot Camp, and it's happening January 25th through 28th live in Franklin, Tennessee. It's going to be happening at the legendary Sound Kitchen Studios, where records like Taylor Swift, Paramore, Keith Urban, Bruce Springsteen, and many more have been made. You'll be learning in these rooms where multi-platinum songs have come to life, and we'll be bringing in some of the best and the brightest who are doing it every day to share their wisdom, knowledge, and experience. This is a great opportunity for you to take your music production, songwriting, or artistry skills to the next level. The music industry doesn't have to be some big secret. Me and the other coaches really want to share what we are doing with you. Come and learn it with us. Registration is now open at fullcirclegoeslive.com. Again, that's fullcirclegoeslive.com. It's limited to only 40 spots, so get yours now. These sell out quick, so don't miss your chance. I'll see you there. And now let's jump into the episode. Hey, this is Seth Mosley, Full Circle Music Show. I'm here in the studio with Katie Wynn. We're on the second, count it, number two, Ask Me Anything episode. She uh, actually sent us an email. She's going to Belmont University right now, is friends with our previous uh, Ask Me Anything co-host, Kaylee Ingram, if you guys heard that episode. And she was like, hey, I've got this class project. Can I ask you some questions for it? I was like, well, why don't you just interview us and co-host the Full Circle Music Show? And she said no, and then we begged her a bunch of times, and she's here now. So <laughs> so thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. So what year are you in Belmont? I'm a sophomore, songwriting okay. major. Songwriting so. major, mm-hmm. awesome. What's been some of the biggest things you've learned since moving to Nashville? Wow, there's a lot of really good food. And (laughs) there are a lot of discreet houses that are actually studios. And you might see random people like Steven Tyler at Pancake Pantry, and that's totally normal. And people don't fangirl as much as other people would. So that's really cool that people give other people privacy and treat them with respect. So I think that's really cool. That's awesome. So you're taking songwriting classes. Are you doing you know, internships, how are you kind of approaching your career? What are your goals out of coming to Belmont and well, taking that? Being in the songwriting program has really helped me see the different possibilities of what I could do in the industry, being a producer. There's not a lot of women producers, so that's really cool that they encourage that. I'm interested in doing TV, possibly songwriting for ads, mm-hmm. anything like that. Eventually want to have my own business, helping people with live events, hooking up smaller bands with local events that they could play for. Very cool. that's in goal somewhere in there. Awesome. We'll just flip this on its head a little bit. I'm at your mercy. You ask me anything. So it's all up to you now. All right. So these questions are for one of my classes at Belmont. So my question is, how did you arrive at your current position? And what positions did you have before this one? that made you realize, oh, I want to start full circle. Sure. So it's funny. I always tell people that I've never actually had a job outside of making money in music, which is weird. I realize that's not normal. 
when I was in high school, I guess there was one thing I did. I mowed grass when I was in like <laughs> middle school and high school just to, you know, for my neighbors Classic. and I'd make 15 bucks here, 15 bucks there. And eventually I was like, okay, well I could start giving guitar lessons. I made a little more money doing that. Just started teaching, you know, young kids in our youth group guitar and, you know, some friends at school. And I'd use all my money from guitar lessons to save up and buy like recording equipment and stuff. My first recording setup was actually one of those, I don't even know if you've ever seen it, but it, it's like a standalone Roland. It recorded onto built-in CDRWs, and it was the stupidest thing ever, but I totally learned like just some of the basic fundamental things about recording. So I gave guitar lessons, eventually uh, was enrolled to come to college down here in Nashville at Treveca, which is okay. another music business program, and I got a job offer probably two weeks before I was supposed to come to college, it was a guy who owned a studio in Columbus, Ohio. And he was like, hey, I heard your stuff you're doing. You're doing some good work. I'm looking to expand the business and focus more on the business side and need somebody to help on the production and engineering and writing side. So he offered me a job and I was like, I guess I could go to college or just start doing it. <laughs> so True. I kind of took the unconventional route and just bailed last minute. I had all my classes scheduled, had my roommate, had everything. And jumped into just working full time. I wasn't making a ton of money. I was making a thousand bucks a month, you know. But I was living at home. I felt like I was to be paid anything to do it and just learn and get my ten thousand hours was huge. So every job, even from the beginning, has been something related to music. Because even from there, I started my own band and was still producing indie records on the side, and then eventually got hired to produce some label artists and artists I'd grown up listening to like Newsboys. So all of my gigs, quote unquote, have been just music. And really what Full Circle Music was, was it was an effort for me to make it about more than just me. It was an effort to make it about a team. And I just thrive in that environment. I think if I was still doing it the way that I used to do it, which was just me doing everything. I played everything. I was mixing. I was editing. I was writing. I was, you know, just, it's just impossible. You know, you burn out. There's a lot of producers and writers that burn out because they're trying to do too much on their own. And so Full Circle Music really wasn't changing what I was doing. It was just expanding my team. And that's really what it's been. So I'm very, and I realize I'm very, you know, fortunate. I'm one of the few people that hasn't had to work at Starbucks or, do that I've, I've always been able to somehow figure out a way to make money even if it wasn't a lot doing music that's really cool yeah so could you describe a typical day for me whether it's typical day songwriting or producing or what are your processes that go into a typical day i think that's one of the things i love about it there really is no typical i guess i could give you a few different examples from like this week okay um, <laughs> perfect like I wrote, I think it was Monday or Tuesday with, there's an artist named Brandon Heath who I've done some work with and one of our new writers, a guy named Riley Friesen, me and him and Brandon were scheduled to write. So that day, like most days, I have a two-year-old, so I was woken up by her like hitting me in the face at five in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and so I spent a couple hours with her, hang with my wife. I'm big on family balance and like actually prioritizing that. I think a lot of us as creatives are really bad at that, but beginning of the day and the end of the day is always family time. I'm not doing emails and that kind of stuff. So do that in the morning, go to the session probably about 10 or 11 o'clock, sit down. When I came in, they were already kind of there. Brandon had gotten there earlier and they were kind of hanging and talking and just getting to know each other because they had never met before. Eventually we're like, okay, so what do you want to do today? What are you feeling? Like we'll literally spend the first probably half hour or an hour just talking about where you at, what's the stuff that ticks you off right now? What's the stuff that's gets you excited? How can we kind of help solve some problems? You know, what do you need? So a lot of it just really starts with listening and figuring out what is our role gonna be today? You know, what does he want from us or need from us? And so after talking for a little bit, he plays us some music and you know, hit play on one of his iPhone just work tapes. And I was like, it's cool. It's a cool guitar riff. Super cool. Had cool melody. And then Riley was like, hey, I had this idea this morning in the shower. And as <laughs> as every good yes. idea comes from the shower, <laughs> Brandon was like, okay, yours is probably better because yours came from the shower. <laughs> and so he, he had came in and scratched it out really quick on Pro Tools just before we 
started it, w- it wasn't anything developed it was like three tracks and a vocal but he plays it and it's this amazing like verse chorus melody thing with a little bit of a scratch lyric and we're like okay well that doesn't suck let's do that <laughs> <laughs> perfect so we worked on that from about 11 to 2 30 or 3 kind of just fleshing out lyrics melodies trying to develop a new section working on the track cutting a pretty decent demo vocal. So usually by the end of that day, we have a pretty good representation of, you know, what the quote unquote demo looks like from there. It obviously is taken and gets tweaked and polished up and edited and mixed and all the stuff that, you know, you would normally do in a master. We just do in demos because we believe in selling it on the front end. So that's kind of a typical songwriting day. That'll, you know, wrap up around 5 PM. I'm home hang out with my daughter a little bit, give my wife a break, and then we'll eat dinner and go to bed and find out what's going on in the uh, presidential debates after that. So (laughs) that's kind of a typical songwriting day. Cool. What's it like working with artists who have never recorded before, never really written, but like, do you ever work with artists who are brand new to the scene? You know what? We used to do a lot more of that. Development is still and is becoming more of a priority for us to find and work with people from the ground level. I think for us, usually, even if we're developing somebody, they've had a little bit of experience. I think it's been a very long time since we had somebody step in the vocal booth or in the studio that had never done it before. I honestly can't even remember the last time we did that. I mean, I'm just looking at Jericho. It's like, I I don't think either of us can remember that. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely did my fair share of it in the beginning. And it's not to say that we're above it you know we're, yeah, we're de- yeah. that's definitely not the case because sure. it's not even a talent or experience thing it's just i mean we've been blessed to work on some of our dream projects over the last few years and we have to say no to a lot more stuff than we say yes to and unfortunately a lot of what that means is on the very beginning it just takes it's a journey for one to find themselves as an artist and who they are they're very unlikely going to know exactly who they are what their voice is what they have to say what the sound is day one. It's going to take sometimes years of figuring that out. So usually by the time we end up working on something or with somebody, they've kind of already done a lot of that legwork, so to speak. But, you know, there are people that are less experienced than others and we don't treat them any differently. It's just, you know, maybe we're coaching them a little more. Maybe we're, maybe they're leaning on us a little more than some other artists would, but it's not in any way going to say that the product's going to turn out any lesser you know we're the quality bar has got to be the same no matter if you've been doing it for 100 years or if you've been doing it for a day so perfect yeah what things are important to know for someone who is interested in this type of job things that are important to know for somebody looking to become a producer producer, songwriter mixer engineer anything yeah yeah that's a great question i think number one is expectations I think a lot of people have very idealistic expectations of what it's going to be like when they get into the business and then get into it and a year into it, it's not what they thought it was going to be, so they quit. I think you see that 90% of the time. And that kind of bums me out because I feel like often a lot of people pull the plug right before they find their magic thing. It's like a lot of people quit literally right like seconds before their quote-unquote big break or whatever, you know? So expectations that it's going to take a long time, probably, to figure it out. There's very few examples otherwise. You know, I've heard, like one of our last podcasts was with a guy named Barry Grohl, who plays guitar for this band Mercy Me, and has played with, you know, Toby and DC Talk and a bunch of other artists. And the advice that he gave that I told him I'm probably going to be repeating over and over again is, number one, move to Nashville because you just have to be there. Absolutely. And number two, stay there for seven years. And I was like, wow, that's the first time I've heard anybody put a number to it. But that's actually probably pretty accurate because I was thinking about it. Like, I've been here for probably eight, eight and a half years now. And I literally, in just in the last couple of years, feel like I have started to realize who I am, like what I offer to this industry that other people don't. I realize my weaknesses. I realize my strengths. And I feel like I have... Honestly, the big thing is the relationship element. It takes a long time just to develop relationships. That's with your team. That's with P. 
people outside of your team. I think that's probably the biggest thing is just have expectations. It's going to take a long time. You just need to know that if you feel like you're called to do something and you cannot imagine doing anything else, then you're probably a pretty good fit for it. If you've got all these backup plans, you're probably going to do the backup plan, you know, but right. For me, it was always like, oh, this is, I literally just feel like I suck at everything else. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like, I don't really have a lot of choice. This is, I just got to make it work. So that's what's nice about Belmont is that they make sure that you have an understanding of what every aspect in the business is like. So you don't just rule something out or sure. they just quit. A lot of people do come in wanting to be the singer songwriter. I'm going to be a big artist. And then they realize, wow, I'd be a great A&R person. Or exactly. I'm, it's really, that's really neat. And it's not even to say that you're selling out or anything because a lot of people genuinely, like me, I'm, I'm a good example of it. Like I thought I was going to be the artist guy. And I realized very quickly into it after about a couple of years of touring like crazy, I realized that that's not what makes me happy. And so for me to switch hats was a completely natural thing. And for somebody who maybe comes wanting to be a songwriter but ends up becoming an A&R person, it's great. If you know if that's what they love to do, they still get to work with music. There really is kind of a, again, to quote Barry, it's kind of like there's a place for everybody. I genuinely get that sense. If you are 100% sold out because you're passionate about music and the power of music, that there really is a place for everybody. That's cool. How did being in a band help you or did it hinder you? Or what was that like being yeah. in a band, having your own band? I think it's actually a big advantage just in terms of relatability. I think the people that we work with, our clients are all artists, you know? So I, I feel like I have a leg up on people who didn't have that experience just because I know what it's like to be broken down on the side of a road in Iowa in a <laughs> snowstorm waiting for three hours before your tow truck comes. You know, I know what it's like to play to rooms full of 7,000 people. And I know what it's like to play to rooms literally where the only other audience is the people you're on tour with. Wow. I've seen all sides of it, you know. And I realized I've been on the radio tours. I realized that the artist is ultimately the one who's going to have to be passionate about delivering the message of the song. Us as producers and song artists, we have so little control over what happens with our songs after we write them and jettison them out there, so to speak. I think me understanding that, I feel like I approach it a lot more as a servant role. It's how can I serve the artist because they're going to be the ones championing these songs every night. And ultimately, that's a great thing because they're the ones doing a good chunk of the hard work. You know, a lot of people kind of get bent out of shape that artists, it's almost like the standard now is artists have to write on their own stuff, whether that's a monetary thing, they just need need right. the publishing off mm -hmm. of it or because they want to be invested in the birth of those songs. But a lot of songwriters have kind of get bent out of shape about it, but I'm like, actually it makes kind of perfect sense because they're actually the ones going to go out and do all the hard work and they're going to be the ones doing the 4 a.m. bus calls and singing the song every single night for the rest of their lives. Exactly. <laughs> so they're working it for us. So I'm, I'm glad to partner with artists who are, you know, I realized that I couldn't do it without, without artists. So. I feel like me having that experience in my story has given me a significant amount of empathy for the people that we get to work with. I like that. Who was or is your favorite artist to work with and why? Like, What is a big project you're like, wow, I've always wanted to do this and I'm so glad I got to do this. This has changed my career path or my life. Sure. Picking my favorite artist to work with is like picking my favorite kid. Yeah, of which, course, of course. <laughs> right, right, right. It's kind of easy for me because I only have one kid at the moment. So <laughs> not the same with artists. I've worked with a lot more than one artist. I'll just give an example of probably the one that changed my life in the biggest way was, well, for two reasons. Number one, I got their record when I was seven years old. It was my first CD I got. It was this band called Newsboys song yes. or the record called Take Me to Your Leader. Mm-hmm. So they changed my life in a big way of, I just dove head first into it. And it was like, wow, this is really awesome music. It's saying something. The lyrics are super weird and different and left field. And the music was cool. And it just changed my life. But then to fast forward to 2009 or something, I think it was around 2009. I was in Nashville 
and got an opportunity to produce their record Born Again, which that changed my life in terms of maybe validating that the producer writer hat is where I'm meant to be. It's where I felt my first momentum. Peter Furler, who was the former frontman, who's actually going to be here in five hours. Nice. He he kind of was the one who gave me a thumbs up that you need to give this guy a shot, basically. And so that was huge because he was like my hero growing up, you know. So I think it's not even to say they're my favorite artist I've worked with because that's impossible for me to right, say. But right. it's totally I understand. But it's it was definitely the most life changing in terms of putting me on the map and opening a zillion other doors and. It honestly helped to make the decision easier to get off the road as an artist, too, because I was having some success and, you know, paying my bills off of it. And I had just gotten married. My wife was had just moved from Sweden. So it was like culture shock for her. And wow. I think for her, it was like a silver lining of like, oh, he might actually not be touring forever. <laughs> right. Which I could never do now, having a kid especially. I just, I can't, I know artists do it all the time, but. It just blows my mind. I, I That's one thing that me and my wife and our family, we could just never do it that way. We travel a lot, actually. We're going to Sydney to Hillsong here in a couple of weeks, and but they always come with me. Or right. if we like go to Bethel in Reading, like they always come with me, you know? So that's it's so fun. To me, it's just not worth it to be away from them that long. Right. Actually, Joel Smallbone, when he was talking about prices, they showed prices at... Belmont. Yeah. And he was awesome. saying how he and Mariah Peters had spent, they had spent like three weeks apart and just having their own highs of what was happening in their life. And it was just really cool. And then when they came back together, there was something that was missing because they had missed out on those opportunities to see each other succeed in their lives. So it's just saying how that, yes, that made them stronger, but they realized that there needed to be a better balance of what they saw each other do and um, sure. be there to support each other. So, sure. What was it like winning a Grammy and being recognized at Dove Awards and Billboard and CSAC recognitions? What is it like when you hear that? Do you just, are you overwhelmed or what is that like? I mean, I think a lot of it, it's really honestly mixed emotions because number one, I'm massively thankful and grateful for any recognition. I mean, we'd be lying if we, especially even in the Christian music, because it's a whole industry that's built on humility. You know, we're not supposed to technically be lifting ourselves up. You know, that's right. that's not, and I really believe that's just kind of a, a life principle. I think we're here to be servants, but I mean, let's be honest, like who doesn't like getting recognition and saying, hey, you, your piece of work that you did here impacted people so much that they voted that it was the best thing that year, or whatever, you know? So yeah, there's an element where you're just incredibly grateful and glad and it, it feels very validating and affirming. But then I've been on the other side of it where you're cheering for somebody else who won the award. And that can actually be, it's not something that I don't think it's talked about a ton. It's, it can be kind of a disheartening thing and it, it can make a lot of people cynical. So I think there is a negative element to it because it's like, hey, look at me, I'm better than everybody else. And granted, I'm friends with, all of my quote unquote competitors, I don't look at them as that, but right. that's what the world would call it, you know? Mm -hmm. But it can be very frustrating if you've worked for years and like Max Martin, for instance, who's one of my like producer heroes, Swedish pop producer does everything, probably produced to date the most number one, produced and written the most number ones of anybody in the world in history. He didn't win his first Grammy until like last year. Wow. <laughs> Or two years ago. So. Is that for like Taylor Swift's record or something like that? I don't even know. I think it was just like a producer of the year, writer wow. of the year, thing, which that's... is just crazy to me. Like this is the guy that's had the most number one. And I've had years where we've had a crazy amount of number ones or stuff on the charts and we didn't get nominated for anything. So it's I'm going on a little bit of a tangent with kind of how the whole awards thing works. But to get back to your original question of how does it make me feel, I mean – Number one is incredibly grateful. Number two is partially undeserving because I know everybody else who's in these categories alongside me and I know how talented they are. So even to be recognized or nominated alongside them is an honor in and of itself, let alone winning anything. 
but I think it is, this is one thing that Nashville is getting better at, and, and I'm passionate about us getting better at, is celebrating our victories. Because oftentimes we're only treated as good as our next number one or our next hit record or right. whatever it is, you know. And I think that's kind of unhealthy. I think it actually is a good exercise, if nothing else, just for the discipline of stopping and intentionally celebrating our accomplishments and our work. Maybe not even accomplishments is the right word, but our work. Just the fact that we've all showed up 365 days a year, stop, have a night like the Grammys where you can dress up, take your wives out, take pictures, and celebrate a year's worth of work. So even if we you know, come out of an award show like that, without any hardware, it's still a great opportunity for us to see our friends and to just congratulate each other on putting in another year because we all know how hard it is. Like, to stay motivated and inspired is probably, you know, I mean, it's less about staying motivated and inspired and just more about being disciplined. And so we all know how hard it's been for each other. Like us, our collaborators, our competitors, our whatever you want to call it. So it's the award shows are always a good opportunity for us to just stop and say, you know what, keep doing what you're doing, keep on, keep fighting the good fight. So I think that's what I appreciate about nights like that the most. That's so fun. It's good to have fun sometimes. It is. <laughs> not that your job is not fun, but it's nice to be able to see everybody else and how far they've come and how far you've come and how you work together yeah. in the industry. Especially the Christian industry. I mean, life is heavy. It's not easy, you know? I mean, music is not a business you get into. It's not for the faint of heart, (laughs) so to speak. So we all know what it takes and the sacrifices that each of our families make and the sacrifices that we make. So, yeah, it is good. Like you said, it's good to stop and make it fun every now and then. What skills would a beginning producer need, would you say? Coming into the business, maybe just coming out of college or starting their own, doing their own band in their garage, what would you say would be the key things that a beginning producer or writer would need to do to succeed in the business or make connections? I think certainly, I mean, we talked about this a little earlier, knowing Pro Tools or Logic or at least one of the DAWs. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's a major thing. Right. When I first moved here and I was talking to somebody, I was like, yeah, I use Logic and uh, I'm a songwriter. And he's like, oh, that's good skill. You need, you know, that's going to suit you. And later on, I found out that's actually true. Being able to operate a DAW and even just to run it and be fast and and proficient at it in a songwriting session so people aren't waiting around on you, that in and of itself is huge. So that's number one. Number two is learn to be a good collaborator. A lot of people are great creators, but they're not great collaborators. I think that ultimately hurts you in the long run in in a town like Nashville where it really is about collaboration and it's not just about superstars, like one person being the hero. It really is a, it's a team sport, you know? So learn a DAW, learn to be a good collaborator and uh, find a mentor. I think that's a huge thing. If you're up and coming producer or songwriter, your mentor could be another producer or songwriter that you get to sit behind or somebody you do an internship with or could be your college professor, could be somebody you'll never even meet. Like maybe you just follow and study their work. I would consider Max Martin a mentor of mine, even though I've never met him. Right. And then there's also mentors that, you know, if it ever makes sense, you even hire and pay for like a coach or a, just like you would hire a doctor, you know, to help you solve your problems. It can be the same thing. And I've had mentors in every one of those categories. So I think mentors can help you avoid a lot of mistakes. Our whole thing is that there's really only two ways to learn in life is mistakes or mentors. And you can either learn from your own mistakes or you can learn from somebody else's. (laughs) I pick that way. (laughs) It's a lot easier. It's a lot quicker, number one. And in the end of the day, it actually is cheaper too because you wind up figuring out, even if you paid somebody to sit behind them or do a coaching program or something with them, it can help you avoid a lot of mistakes. So I would say those three things, DAWs, learn to collaborate and find a good mentor. Nice. I like that. Uh, that's what they teach us in songwriting class as well. When you have to do co-writes and I've never co-written before. So this is my first time co-writing and it's just a very interesting experience seeing what other people have to bring to the table mm-hmm. and they'll bring it, melodies and lyrics. You're like, wow, 
Mm-hmm. That's incredible. I would have never come up with that. Like, yeah. Maybe I would have in my dreams, but that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But that's what's beautiful about collaboration. Right. You, you are your own angle. You know, it's like everybody's looking for the new fresh angle on something, but you are going to inherently sing things and say things and look at things different than anybody else is because you're an individual human being, you know? And I think that's the beautiful thing about Nashville and collaboration is everybody has something to bring. And they can check you as well. Like, no, I really don't think that that's as amazing as you think it is. <laughs> totally. Yeah, we're all, we're all at each other's checks and balances system. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about your mentors and Max Martin. Is there anyone in Nashville that you just love to work with? Like another producer or writer that you're like, yes, this is, if I had to pick anybody right now that I could call up and say, hey, I need help on this. Is there anybody specific? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, to go back to the full circle music thing, that's been my vision is to build a team of people that are ultimately, I'm learning stuff from them every day. Like, even if we give somebody a publishing deal, I want it to be a person that we sign who I feel like I'm going to learn stuff from even when I go into a session with them. So just to give credit where credit's due, we've got these two writers right now named Matt Hammett, formerly of Sanctus Surreal, and then Riley Friesen, who I just talked about a minute ago. I feel like every time I work with them in a writing session, like we're never going to get stuck because those guys are so incredibly talented. They have so much inspiration. They have so much, they're just geniuses at what they do. They're the best, you know? So I feel like anybody that we work with and anybody in our camp has to kind of check that box of like just being at the highest possible level that I can learn something from. So so them two in particular, I think moving to Nashville, my first guy that brought me here was a producer just to, again, give credit where credit's due. I sent a demo to a producer named Ian Eskelin when I was 16, a little manila envelope, like hard copy EPK thing. <laughs> And uh, he emailed or called back and was just like, hey, come down next week. And to me, I was like freaking out. Like, what does this mean? Am I going to record deal? Or, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be the next touring artist. This exactly. <laughs> yeah. So he brought me down and honestly was a mentor for those first three, four years I was in Nashville in terms of making introductions, literally sometimes telling me what to do and what not to do helping me process through career strategy, helping me avoid mistakes and helping me write songs. Ultimately. I mean, he was, he was the one that introduced me to co-writing. I had never really, I knew about it and I was doing it at the studio in Columbus, like with indie bands. And I just wasn't even really realizing it was a thing that you can do and you can be a career songwriter and you can make money at it. And (laughs) so he introduced me to that. And I'd probably say, you know, you think of those, giants in your life that you you're forever indebted to and and he's definitely one of those guys that early on moving to nashville i probably wouldn't have had my first record deal wouldn't definitely wouldn't have my first publishing deal i wouldn't even known what a publishing deal was probably (laughs) true so i've definitely had my fair share of mentors along the way that's awesome what challenges or opportunities both both of them. What challenges or opportunities do you see in the upcoming year, in the next 18 months uh, that you, projects that you're working on or that you want to work on or just anything? I think the big challenge for everybody is just figuring out how this business is monetized. I think it's changing all the time. I think as songwriters and creators, we're having to get a little more savvy about what we're doing. We're having to think a little more holistic about the entire big picture of things you might need more than just one skill set you might instead of just being a country guitar player you might need to learn how to do your own demos you might need to know how to track stuff edit engineer just be able to be good at learn how to make yourself valuable i think that's the big thing is always learning how to make yourself valuable and that's the biggest challenge and that changes from year to year so you have to be willing to on the drop of a dime you have to be willing to change everything and scrap if I always think about this as a non-music example but like you've been to like Walgreens right you right yes so when Walgreens started out it was like a I think it was a food chain I think it was like a restaurant really and that was their entire business model and you can imagine when their CEO decided 
hey, we're no longer selling food. We're going to switch to, you know, being a pharmacy. They were like, what in the world? You're like ripping out our entire profit center. You're, But that's what it took. He, he saw the future and knew that things were changing. That was not their competitive advantage. And it's the same in music. We have to be willing to rip up the roots of everything that we've done on a moment's notice because the industry is changing faster than any of us realize. So I think the challenge is who's going to be able to adapt, who's going to be the most flexible. I tend to think it's going to be the little guys. This isn't just like some underdog argument, you know, like <laughs> against major labels because I work with major labels all the time and I love them. And, and there's certainly advantages to them in terms of muscle and power, but it's harder to steer a cruise ship as opposed to a rowboat, you know? Nice analogy. So I think you're seeing that on a small level, you're seeing it in the Christian music industry, labels like Centricity, Bethel, small camps like that are having massive victories right now because of their ability to just stay agile, they're lean and mean. Uh, Goatee is another good example, great indie label. So I think you're going to see a lot more of that in the next five to ten years. It's, it's going to be a lot more of the little guy that's coming out on top than it ever, than it ever was. Is that because... There's more competition in the fact that they have to work harder, maybe. I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, to be noticed or to be seen, get their music out into the radio or just in general. I think, and this is just a theory, but I'm a big believer in systems. I think systems are good for anything, but only to a certain extent. When you have a massive company that's has 100 or 200 employees that's owned by a massive you know, company that has no clue of what your industry is, there has to be a set amount of systems that this is the way we do things. This is the way we do things. Otherwise, our whole system doesn't work. It's just inherently. You can't, when you have that big of a organization, there's no other way to, to do it. And you have a lot of people that are depending on those systems to work. So you don't have the ability to just say, you know what, I want to do this tomorrow. I, I'm just going to do it. And that's what, you're seeing a lot of these small guys creating record labels out of nowhere, creating bands out of nowhere and, and just blowing up. And, you know, it's, it's stuff you've never heard of. It's stuff that's awesome, musically compelling. And I think it's people that are able and willing to take risks. I think that's the big thing is people who are not operating out of fear. I'm not saying major labels are all operating out of fear. I think there's an element of fear in anybody who's in music just because it's a crazy industry. Mm hmm. But I just think in an industry where, and in a time where things are shifting and it's kind of, you hear everybody say it's a wild, wild west. I think the guys who can run faster, adapt, be lean and mean, have low overheads and be able to just shift on any moment's notice, that, that's inherently just the little guys. Oh, that's nice. So as we're wrapping up, you got one more thing you wanted to ask about. But uh, before we do that, I just want to say thanks for taking the time to come out here today and do this. It's always fun for me to sit with the next music makers of, of our generation. You're probably going to have some number one song that I'm not even going to know about in the next 10 or 15 years. And what a I'll dream. Say, I'll, say I knew, <laughs> I'll say I knew you win. Wow. So. Uh, what a dream. That would be great. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been awesome. really informational. I have enjoyed this greatly. I just like to, as a songwriter, I'd like to dive into your songwriting process a little bit more do you focus i guess not more on lyrics or more on music but what kind of balance do you like to find when you write do you sure. find yourself like well i need a really deep lyric or i just need something that's really catchy for this song or how do you balance uh, that's a great question and i'll answer it in a little weird way that i promise has to do with your question but it's fine <laughs> Say whatever. i really believe that I say this over and over and over and over again. I feel like I'm a broken record, but it really is a team sport. I think when you look at a when you look at a team, I mean, not every player is a on a basketball team is a center or a, a point guard or a. I don't even know. I don't know why I picked basketball because I don't know basketball. <laughs> is there a striker in basketball? That's soccer, right? I'm sure. Probably, I'm probably the wrong person to use a sports analogy. <laughs> but not everybody is the same position. It's the same. In a human body, not every body part is a foot. Otherwise, that would be a very 
inefficient human body. You'd get places, but you wouldn't smell anything along the way. Um, <laughs> and likewise, not every songwriter is the same. Some people are going to have strength of melody. Some people are going to have strength of lyrics. Some people are going to have strength of music. Some people are going to have strength of just vibe and instinct. And so I think the biggest challenge is to find out who you are and it's not to pigeonhole yourself and say you can't do a little bit of everything, but you're inherently going to be better at some things than you are at others. And that's why I'm such a big believer in the songwriting process, in collaboration, and building a team, building a network of people that you know complement your strengths and your weaknesses. So I know for myself, and it's almost different from genre to genre, but like when I go into a country right, I'm probably going to be more the melody, track, vibe, instinct, guy as opposed to the lyric because that's something that it's a language it's like learning it's like it's like learning another language you know so i'm gonna lean on guys like ben stennis or tom douglas or casey bethard or guys who have written that for decades you know in christian music i kind of grew up on it so I, I feel like i know the language i've done it enough so i may wear a little more of the lyric hat than in country but i still when i work with amia fields who's a phenomenal songwriter, phenomenal lyricist. I mean, she's kind of great all around, but she'd probably say that she's a top liner, like she's lyric, some melody. So I'll shift into more of, again, that track, vibe, melody, instinct, overall kind of editor type position. So I think the big thing is not stressing yourself out that you have to be everything. You can or you really... only have to be one or only the other. Like, like exactly. you said, you have your balance. Yeah. You know where you fit in so i think the bigger thing is writing a lot to figure out what your strengths are what are the things that like you said other people validate you at and say wow you're a really good track person or you're really good after doing several dozen rights you'll figure out what your strength is and what your lane is so i think the big thing is building a team around your strengths and your weaknesses that can be as simple as having a few friends who you do a monthly co-write with or a weekly co-write with and it eventually can evolve into the entire town of Nashville. Like you said, you stay here for seven years and you're really intentional about building those key relationships with people and you honor those relationships in a great way. You can pretty much always have somebody to call if you're stuck. Right. So I know that's a little bit of a roundabout answer to your question in terms of songwriting process. But No, I, it's perfect. Yeah, I'll just say it's less about the process and more about who the people are than following a set of procedures or anything like that. So, And if you get stuck, you'll have people around you to help you with that. Like, Guys, I just really don't know what lyric needs to come next or I need a different word for this. This sounds really cheesy. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yep. That's I, so cool. We have, and we say this all the time, we have this sign in our studio that says, Dare to Suck. And uh, I live by that. I throw out a lot of, for every one good idea, I probably throw out four crappy ones. So. <laughs> Just being willing to try everything and, and knowing that, hey, maybe one of my crappy ideas I can put in my pocket and save for the next thing and it might be the most awesome thing for what that needs, you know? Right. And our songwriting professor, uh, James Teeley, was saying, don't be afraid to put those things out there because somebody else might think that it's really great and can take your bad idea and turn it into something that isn't the next hit song. Or totally. um, on the other side, he was saying that as a songwriter – it's easy for him to think that something is really great, but then the artist disagrees and just says, I don't think that that's where it needs to be yet. And he's like, but I think it sounds fine. He's like, yes, but I'm the one who's going to be singing this for the next however many years. And so that was just a really cool piece of advice that we got from him was just that you need to listen to other people and not just think about how great you think something is and really exactly. working with the team. Yeah. Cool. So... Yeah, that's awesome. This has been a blast. Thanks so much for being here with us, Katie. Thank you for having me. It was great. Hi, this is Seth Mosley. You've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. If you get a chance, head over to iTunes. Leave us a good rating and a good review. We've seen a lot of you guys do that already. I would love if you would literally just take five minutes and head over. It really helps us a ton. I know it seems like a small thing on your end, but it helps us a lot. So head over and do that. Check out the Music Makers Boot Camp, once again, it's at fullcirclegoeslive.com. That's fullcirclegoeslive.com. 
And we hope to see you there. That's again, that's January 25th through 28th, 2017. It's going to be at the legendary Sound Kitchen Studios in Franklin, Tennessee, where records like Taylor Swift, Tim McGraw, Michael W. Smith, and many, many more have been cut. And just to be in that room, I can just say from experience of this is our second one we've done. The first one, we got rated a 9.3 out of 10. I had no idea it was going to go so well just doing our very first one. We're learning how to do it. We're bringing in speakers. We're bringing in some of the people you've heard on this show. We've got industry pros. We've got A&R people, publishers, artists, writers, producers, and they're really just coming to spend a weekend with you and just share what they've learned. You can really ask them anything. Nobody's hiding back in a green room. It's, it's a small, intimate setting. There's only 40 spots available, and we do that on purpose. For us, this isn't just a money-making thing. If we wanted to make money, we would do other things. But we keep it to 40 because we value the intimate atmosphere, and we want to give you an opportunity to get your questions answered, get your songs critiqued, get to co-write and collaborate with an industry pro and to just be there and soak it in. I can say the best way that I've ever learned is through total immersion, just through being in the environment. So whether you're a college student who's already looking for a really intense weekend just to drill down and get some of your questions answered and learn how things actually work in the real world, or you've maybe put your dreams of being a producer or songwriter artist on the back burner, but you're really looking to get a spark of inspiration and injection or maybe you are an active touring artist or songwriter already and you just need a little bit of help you need a little encouragement and inspiration along the way this event is for any of you guys no matter what position that you're in so head over to fullcirclegoeslive.com and that's the music makers boot camp january 25th through 28th 2017 the Full Circle Music Show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins and Kaylee Ingram. And thanks to our guest co-host this week, Katie Wynn. We'll see you next week.